Lieutenant General Cheek will moderate a Q&A session. Ushers will provide microphones, and we request that you utilize them so others can hear. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of the National Anthem by Staff Sergeant Tracy Lebrecht. Please be seated. As part of the 50th anniversary commemoration of the Vietnam War, we are holding Game Changers, a reflection on service, sports, and life. Today's ceremony is hosted by the Director of the Army Staff, Lieutenant General Gary Cheek. Our special guests are Vietnam veterans and NFL legends Roger Staubach and Rocky Blyer. Also here today, representing General Allen, Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, is his wife, Miss Allen. Please direct your attention to the screens for a brief tribute honoring both veterans. Rivals on the football field. Brothers on the battlefield. Roger Stava, the humble kid from Cincinnati, had a legendary career at Navy. Winning the Heisman as a junior, he was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys. But football would wait. He volunteered for Vietnam, arriving in country in 1966. He served in Da Nang and then Chu Lai, quarterbacking a 120-member team. The team handled ammunition and supplies for U.S. Marines fighting in South Vietnam. When his service was complete in 1969, the 27-year-old reported for his rookie season with the Cowboys. He quarterbacked America's team for a decade, never had a losing season. The Cowboys played in five Super Bowls and Captain America commanded four of them. In fourth quarters, when his team was down, he was at his peak. 23 times the father of the Hail Mary engineered comeback victories. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1985, the first year he was eligible. There are two ways to measure a winner. How he performs his job, and more importantly, how he performs as a human being. Roger Staubach is an all-pro in both categories. But if there is a Hall of Fame for people, they better save a spot for him there, too. Number 20, Rocky Blyer. Rocky Blyer was a standout at Notre Dame, a member of the 1966 National Championship Team and captain in 1967. In 1968, he was drafted twice, first by the Pittsburgh Steelers, then by the United States Army for combat duty in Vietnam. On a rescue mission, he was hit by a bullet and then a grenade. 
told by doctors he couldn't play again, Rocky Blyer had a different mission in mind. He fought back, returned to the Steelers, and went on to play in 150 regular season games and four Super Bowls. We live in a country where we make role models, surrogate parents in many cases, of athletic heroes. And very few of them deserve that kind of adulation. But this is an authentic American hero. Number 20, Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, sure, Franco Harris was great, but without the blocking of Rocky Blyer, Harris was nothing, and the whole damn team knew it. Today, Roger Staubach and Rocky Blyer come together, not as rivals, but as comrades, to say thank you to our Vietnam veterans and those now served. It is my honor to introduce the Director of the Army Staff, Lieutenant General Gary Cheek. Uh, of course, I'm happy to give out autographs before, during, and after the uh, ceremony. Uh, but mine are on uh, memorandums of reprimand, so you might want to stay away from me, so I don't know. Uh, not many good things come to the Director of the Army Staff, but this, this is a good thing. So, a good afternoon to everyone. Standing room only, that's as I would have expected. Uh, and it is, it is great to see everybody here. And thank you for many of you taking time out of your very busy schedules to spend some time with us. Um, it's been about 40 years since the epic Super Bowl battles between the Steelers and the Cowboys. And for Roger Staubach and Rocky Blyer, you gave us such great memories. Um, it's great to see a Cowboy and a Steeler together. But let's just say this is a little bit of a friendlier gathering than maybe those were. And uh, what a great tribute in the video, uh, really well done by the G4 and our, and our uh, video folks for putting that together. Great tribute by both Tom Landry and also Howard Cosell, both of whom served in World War II with the United States Army. Uh, Tom Landry with the Air Corps, which was ours back then. Uh, we spun that off as a, a cost-saving measure. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and also uh, Mr. Cosell, of course, with the Army. Now, you may not have noticed one of the little clips in there had a picture of Roger Staubach lighting an Olympic flame. And I would, I would mention that because I happened to be there in 2009 at the very first Warrior Games. We asked Roger to come do that, and he did. And both he and Rocky Blyer was there as well and spoke at the closing ceremonies of that. So they are certainly no strangers to, uh, to our, our service members across the various services. And that one particular point in time, very special to me and very thankful for, uh, for all that they've done. Um, today, uh, we have soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, all here from about every war uh, since, the, since World War II. We're joined by some of our more senior civilians and children of Vietnam veterans, to include Debbie Allen here, whose uh, father served in Vietnam. And we want to thank all of you uh, for coming. You know, our memories of the Vietnam War started about 50 years ago, and they're really quite different than the experience that our soldiers today uh, have received. You know, we sent our soldiers, our troops, to Vietnam to perform a duty that many Americans did not support, and many Americans did not honor them when they returned. They returned home to criticism and scorn, and many continue to deal with the challenges that, uh, that came from that. But it is remarkable how our country has changed. The positive response that our service members get today when they return home from theater um, is in large part due to the veterans of the Vietnam War who were determined that this would never happen again. And I can tell you just from my own experience of dealing with our many international partners of other countries, they are enormously envious of the warm reception and the, and the love that Americans show you know, for their military. So we're very grateful to our Vietnam generation for all that they did 
to turn America around as far as how it treats its service members. So it's our gratitude for those of you who served in Vietnam. Um, it may be that our tribute today is 50 years too late, but it is a sincere tribute. This year, uh, almost 9,000 commemorative partners across the country are holding events like this in parks, businesses, schools to honor Vietnam veterans and their families. And we also want to remember the 58,220 Americans who gave their lives in Vietnam, including Bob Kalsu of the Buffalo Bills and Don Steinbrenner of the Cleveland Browns. Today, we're joined by two great leaders, and we would ask them to reflect on their service, sports, and their life, and to help us honor the millions who served with them. So let's all be inspired to see veterans, past, present, and future, with a new, re renewed perspective. And to our Vietnam veterans especially, I want to say welcome home. Thank you. Thank you, General Cheek. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Roger Staubach. Well, it's a, it's a uh, real honor to be here, and thank you, General Cheek. And it's uh, kind of rough being with the Steeler, though, you know. It's, <laughs> it's almost like hanging out with the Taliban or something, you know. That, <laughs> yeah. No, no, just, uh, no, they, they were th 35 to 31. Uh, <laughs> in Super Bowl 13, that was, the, that was the tough one. And the biggest play of the game was right before the half. It was 14 to 14. We were making a comeback, and Rocky Blyer cut a touchdown pass in the end zone that, to me, was the biggest play in the game because we made it 21 to 14, and we, and we lost 35 to 31. So... Um, it was a, uh, they were a great football team. Uh, I think the, arguably, probably one of the best, the, maybe the best football team that uh, came together. They, they had a fantastic uh, defense led by Jack Lambert and a fantastic offense uh, led by Terry Bradshaw and Rocky and Franco and, oh man, it makes me sick saying all this, but it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, you got you to gotta admire though. Uh, we, I've always said we lost to the best team that's ever played in the National Football League. So it, it's, a, it's, it's an honor being here. I was only a lieutenant in the Navy, so <laughs> I know that uh, being honored here has, has a lot to do with, uh, with, with my football career. And, um, and it was really kind of amazing because, you know, the Redskins weren't our favorite team or anything, you know. So, <laughs> so, so to be in Washington, D.C., uh, but the first office, I, when I started my real estate firm, um, which I had for 30 years, our first office outside of Dallas was Washington, D.C. I'm thinking, oh, we're in trouble here, but it, it, <laughs> it, it, it turned out really well. So I, I um, look at it also in, in the service. I, I, was, I was partially colorblind, and, and so when I graduated, I knew that I, was, I couldn't fly, I couldn't uh, go Navy line, and I, I probably could have been wavered into the Marine Corps. And, uh, the Marines, uh, <laughs> uh, w when you were at the Naval Academy, you knew you wanted to be a Marine when you were a plebe. So I, I, I admired the Marines. Uh, a lot of my teammates were Marines. And, uh, but I stuck to the Navy, and I went into, uh, I went into uh, the Supply Corps. I was a, a Navy officer, went through uh, uh, training as a supply officer and then uh, asked to go to Vietnam to feel I, I wanted to do something uh, to give back and I, I wasn't out on the battlefield but I was out supporting uh, I was with the Naval Support Group in Da Nang and we uh, had a responsibility then I, I went down I was there for six months and I went to Chu Lai for six months used to go go a lot to Quang Nai and down to Saigon and uh, so I was moving around logistically in the I Corps area at that time of South Vietnam was occupied by the Marines. That was 66 and 67. The Army was coming in when I was, when I was uh, leaving. But I, I really supported the Marines. Uh, I was a Navy, Navy officer supporting the Marines. Uh, they, some of the Marines, we, we went through uh, training together. I had, to, I, I had to go through all the training to go over there. And I was, uh, went to you know POW camp at Whidbey Island. And, 
I was the only one to escape, by the way, uh, <laughs> from that camp. Uh, I don't like to talk about that. There's some, <laughs> but but the 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 uh, so I, I I've come to really love the Marine Corps. Uh, I, I love all the military, but the Marines. Uh, I, I I saw them in action. Uh, some of my teammates were Marines that that were shot and killed over there in Vietnam. So, uh, but all of our military that fought in in Vietnam, uh, it it was uh, we were asked to do it. It wasn't a popular war. And as General Cheek said, it, was, it really was a, a shame how our Vietnam veterans were tr treated. By the time I left the service, I went to Pensacola Naval Air Station, finished up, joined the Cowboys in 1969, the, and, and my own teammates were giving me a hard time. They are a bunch of friggin' draft dodgers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm in there arguing uh, about, uh, and so the, the the, the, the good news today is that we really care about our military. Uh, and I, I mentioned this earlier today. I was, I was at the airport in Dallas not that long ago, and, uh, and some military uh, men and women were there, about seven of them there in, in their fatigues. And, and uh, I guess they, somebody happened to recognize me. Now they, you know, when you get old like this, they, God, I've seen you somewhere before. Who? <laughs> Uh, I've been Frank Gifford. I've been uh, 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 I, I've been a lot of different people. So, uh, uh, and I go along with it. So, but but but, but anyway, one, one of them uh, uh, remember, you know, you know, remember me. So I went over. I was talking to him, and a woman came over and gave gave the guy two one hundred dollar bills and said, "Hey, take your take your uh, your, your 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 other uh, military." Uh, people to, to lunch and uh, and he you know he tried to get the money back but you know she she wouldn't take it and then he he just said to me he said you know it's it, it's uh, it's nice that you know <laughs> that we're, we're going to have lunch she gave me the money but it really that's not the issue the issue is that that they care about us and um, hearing that time and time again how important it is. And, and we're a volunteer service in a very unstable world today. And, and our military is, are, are extremely important to ourselves, our kids, our grandkids. Actually, I've got two great-grandchildren. Don't look like it, do I? But, but I've been uh, <laughs> married 50 years. So it's uh, we, our oldest daughter, has given a student who <laughs> grandsons want he's, one, two, and what one, uh, we got 15 kids. I was an only child, so uh, it's uh, and five children, 15 kids, and two great-grandchildren. Uh, that, that's, that's a lot of human beings that, uh, <laughs> that want to be in a, in, a, in a great country, in a, in a great world, and, uh, and they also want to be protected. And uh, the men and women in our armed services and wh what they do for us, it's, uh, it, 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 is, it is appreciated today more than ever. But it can't be appreciated too much for what uh, the commitments, the sacrifices that you make to uh, protect our families. And uh, I've been proud to be part of that fraternity. I was uh, only in the service for four years before I joined the Cowboys. And uh, I'm still very involved with the Naval Academy. I'm on the foundation board there. And uh, I, I, I really feel proud to be a fraternity brother in, in the services, even though I'm not a retired service. I still feel that I've been accepted uh, for my service, and uh, I'm very proud of my service, and I am uh, even more proud, more proud of our uh, military and what they do for us today, and it's a real honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Staubach. It is now my honor to introduce Mr. Rocky Blyer. Yeah, thank you. Oh. I didn't see any cowboy towels out there, did I? Uh, <laughs> although I saw a Romo jersey over here. I saw there she had it. Good God. 
You know, it is, uh, uh, I have to tell you, it's amazing for me to be able to be here, uh, you know, along with uh, the general and, um, and with Roger, uh, and thanking all you for your service, and, and to our fellow Vietnam uh, veterans, welcome home, brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a great experience for me, especially when <coughs> you're enlisted, and my highest rank was um, spec four, you know, and so for most of my military career, it was always, yes, sergeant, no sergeant, <laughs> yes, sir, no, sir, you know, and I was afraid to see a, a captain, holy gripe sakes, and then I got a major, geez, and then a colonel, oh, you know, and then I'd wet my pants if a general walked by, you know, you go, holy man, and just now to be able to uh, be here and to be with, uh, with everybody, it's a, uh, and, and that's all come from the world of, of, of football, not to because of anything that I did, but because of what a group and a team and an organization um, had accomplished, and you get recognized for your contribution for that period of time. But listen to uh, Roger, it just it <laughs> remind me of a, of, a, of, a, of a book that I recently read, um, and, and the author um, stated that, in this book that our, our, our physical components change every seven years so that our brains continuously pass memories off onto a complete stranger. <laughs> Who we have been is just now a fellow ghostly traveler. <laughs> if memory were total and complete, perhaps we would be one person from start to finish, but forgetfulness cuts us off from who we have been so that hourly we are reborn, okay. <laughs> now, I tell you that in context uh, only because, uh, you know, I am in my late seventh decade of creating memories. <laughs> and in some regards, even though I may not be the same person I was when I was walking in the rice paddies in Vietnam or the last time I wore a, unif uh, a uniform in the National Football League, um, but the highlights of my life and my career, obviously, like all of ours, are forever etched in my memory. What I've come to learn, it's not that I have forgotten who I am or what had taken place in my life, but, but it's usually an audience that has forgotten who I am and, <laughs> and how I single-handedly won those four Super Bowls <laughs> with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Ah, uh, you know, I mean, Roger and I have been a, 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 together at times. It, it, we've been together at times, you know, over the over the period of, and he keeps bringing up Super Bowl thirteen. <laughs> we had the lead before Jackie Smith dropped the ball. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you have to understand. You have to understand. So he brought up that play, but. It was just not an ordinary play. It was an, really an extraordinary play, actually, <laughs> that had taken place. And, um, and since I have the platform now, I'd like to take you back briefly in time <laughs> to that game. As Roger said, it was a very toughly fought battle in the first half, and the score was tied 14-14, and under interception, great defensive play. Not, it was a bad throw, but it was a great defensive play. Um, <laughs> That we intercepted the ball and took it back and took it down to the 11-yard uh, line, and now the situation is right before the half. Uh, it's third down and one yard to go for a first down, and the ball's on the 17-yard line. play that was called was a quick pass play to the halfback, myself, <laughs> where I'd go right down the line of scrimmage. Bradshaw would hit me very quickly with the ball. I'd gather it in over my shoulder fall over the line, pick up the first down, keep the momentum going, and hopefully later we could get the score. Well, when the ball was snapped, I did come bursting out of my stance. Now, my opponent across from me, his teammate, um, wily old veteran by the name of Didi Lewis, immediately jumped across that line of scrimmage and took my path away from me. <laughs> and the best that I could do is to be 
adaptable, a little flexible, and I kind of slid inside of him. And as I went by him, he realized it was a pass play and that he had me in man-to-man -man coverage, and so he quickly spun to the outside, momentarily losing sight of me. And as he lost sight of me, I kind of drifted backwards and, and found myself in the end zone. <laughs> now, in the meantime, Bradshaw was faking to my running mate, Franco Harris, into that line of scrimmage, and when he pulled that ball out, looking for that receiver, myself, down that line of scrimmage. And when he did not spot me, being the smart, intelligent <laughs> quarterback that we perceived him to be, <laughs> it finally dawned on him that it might be a broken play. So he tucked the ball underneath his arm, started to scramble to his right, and as he's scrambling to his right, sideline was looming up, opposite side of him, larger than life, Neanderthal beans with lobotomies chasing him down. <laughs> then it happened. Maybe once in a lifetime will you ever experience it. When all time just seems to stand still. And our eyes met. across the field. Now 30 yards separating us. And under pressure, he released that ball. Maybe a little too quickly. Maybe a little too high. But it came floating into that end zone. And as it came floating into that end zone, I leaped all five foot nine and a half inches of me <laughs> with all my might straight up in the air as high as I could go. I don't know, 18. 19, 20 feet, I, I kind of forget after, <laughs> after all these years. And I, and I grabbed that ball and came down across that goal line and gave us a score and a lead. Oh, and a lead we'd never relinquished. <laughs> but I usually tie that story in, and I have to tell you, and, and I <laughs> I, I, I want that film. I want that film. Now, it cost me a lot of money. I've never seen that film for Howard Cosell to give that di dialogue that he did. It did cost me a lot of money for him to say that. <laughs> I, otherwise, it wouldn't have. But anyway, I want. Now, I usually see use that story because one of the questions that is asked of me more often than not is. Um, Geez, Rocky, you got four Super Bowl rings. <laughs> uh, do you change them every day? <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you decide which one to wear? I mean, which one's better than the other one? Which one do you like more than the other one? Well, I have to tell you in all honesty, it's this one that I wear on my right hand from Super Bowl thirteen, the second time that <laughs> <coughs> we had played the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> And I tell that story and for a reason why I wear that ring, because it was the best game I played in, one I scored a touchdown in. But it's, it's not the real reason I, I wear this ring. The real reason is because it happens to be the largest and gaudiest of all, <laughs> all four of them. But. <laughs> but for me, you have to understand, it was, a, uh, it was a honor and a privilege to be able to you know, be at the right place, right time, or given an opportunity, you know, as we have in our lives to uh, be able to take advantage of um, that opportunity that exists to be able to play a game of, of, uh, of, of football. For you see, you know, I got drafted as the, as it said, um, in 1960, in 1968, um, after about 10 games into the season and found myself in basic training, advanced infantry training, like thousands of other young men during that period of time um, and went over to, you know, Vietnam and then got wounded twice um, in, a, in a combat effort that had taken place. And our mission basically was to go back and retrieve bodies that we had left behind. Two days earlier, sister company had been hit. And we uh, were deployed to pull them out of that hot spot. And on our way out that evening, um, we had run into a machine gun nest. And so uh, a firefight had taken place 
to get ourselves out of there. We had leave the bodies. Now two days later, we're coming back to be able to retrieve those bodies. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. We just took a break trying to find our location where it was settled up and moved out onto an open rice paddy. Keep your eyes and ears open, your heads on a swivel, because we know that the enemy are around. And we walked on the open rice paddy, and all of a sudden, our point man hollered gook gook, and shots broke the stillness, and we started to race down the middle of the rice paddy when the machine gun opened the area. Guys were diving left and right. And my responsibility, because I was a grenadier carrying an M79, to get firepower on that position, and I rolled over on my side, breached a grenade to do so when I felt the thud the first time and got hit through the thigh. Discharged that round, dropped back behind some protection. But got enough firepower on it to get the four guys down. And I tell you that only because now there's a law in action. For those who have been there, there's a law in action. And at that moment in time, one of the questions that is most asked of me today is at what it's like playing against Roger or in Super Bowls or in national championship games. But what was it like to be in combat? Because there is no reference to that experience. There's reference to playing sports in the backyard pickup. We get an idea of what it's like playing baseball or football or hockey. But what is it like to be in combat? Well, you see, as we well know, I mean, 1% of our population serves our, in the military. Less than 10% of that finds themselves in a combat situation. So there's really no reference point. Obviously, you think, I, 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 I think to myself, obviously, those people who ask me those questions Never had a Catholic education. <laughs> and I say that in all honesty. See, I had eight years of Notre Dame nuns and four years of Christian brothers and four years of Holy Cross priests, so I knew what combat was all about. <laughs> Where you see, there's nothing more fearful than a good sister with a ruler in her hand <laughs> and righteousness in her eyes looking at you walking down that aisle. But the amazing thing is that what they taught you during that period of time, and I'm not just saying a Catholic education, I'm just saying what they taught you, you know, and they taught you, you know, they taught you, your, your, they, and I remember this thing, they taught you your manners, which was um, yes, sister, no, sister. And then it morphed into yes, mom, no, mom, and yes, dad, no, dad. And, and it was, yes, father, no father, and yes, brother, no brother, you know, yes, sergeant, no sergeant, yes, dear, no dear. <laughs> so I had a great education through that period of time. But what they also taught you to do is really they taught you how to pray. And we do that in our lives only because of the fact that, you know, we pray for... <sighs> No tests. <laughs> we pray for days off. We pray for wins. We pray that we get an A in, the, <laughs> in our class. We pray that the little redhead might like you someday. And, uh, and then we pray that we come back from war. But sometimes we have to realize what we pray for. You know, because we have to live with the atrocities that take place. We have to live with the scars, visible or invisible. We have to live with the trauma. We have to live with what happens at that period of time. But it's a foundation, and it's an experience. And it's really only experience that we, who have served in the military, understand. Um, and it's the lessons that you learn from then that you incorporate into your own life, your background, your education, your experiences. And what you bring to your community and what you bring to your families and what you do every day. So Roger and I aren't any different than any of you. Those lessons we learned on the gridiron as well as in the battlefield are the same ones that we learn every day in our lives, and that's to take care of one another. You never leave a comrade behind, and you fight for what is right, and you do what is right. And, uh, and I think that's the biggest 
message that I ever received from my experience in coming back because to some degree, you know, I came back in a high profile industry and so because of being an underdog and because of being wounded, because of being in combat, I became somewhat of a poster child for the military and at least for our Vietnam brothers was somebody that they could look at and say, hey, he did it. He's one of us. And he became successful because it was not much success that was taking place within our lives at that time or recognized for that success because, as we well know, no one recognizes for a contribution to our country. And so until now and what has taken place and over the last 20 years and more importantly now is the anniversary is on its threshold, you know, that we do thank our veterans, all of them, but more importantly to that Vietnam veteran for the sacrifices that they have given and done through those years. So I want to thank all of you for your service. More importantly, again, welcome home, Vietnam veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blyer. We will now begin the Q&A session. At this time, General Cheek, Mr. Staubach, and Mr. Blyer, please move to the chairs at center stage. General Cheek will moderate the session, and our ushers have microphones. <laughs> so please ask your questions into the microphones, as this is being streamed live. <laughs> no, this is great. I have to tell you. All I, oh, can you hear me? You know, I think, I, I, I just have to tell you this is because it, <laughs> since we had started, since Colonel Kincaid first contacted me <laughs> about doing this, you know, I forget, I forgot how organized the, uh, the military is <laughs> and, <laughs> and how thorough the military is. It's unlike the civilian world <laughs> where, <laughs> hey, I hope you show up <laughs> you know, and find your way down here. So, <laughs> knowing that my name's on this. <laughs> and uh, I was two and two in Super Bowls, and you can tell that's the reason I got this humility that he doesn't have right now. <laughs> Well, if you won the other ones, you wouldn't <laughs> need to be humble. <laughs> All right, I'm here. Uh, Pittsburgh native, Steelers fan, but uh, you know, son of a Vietnam veteran. My older brother's a Vietnam veteran. But my question is, I've, I've read about that card that Mr. Rooney sent you. Oh, yeah. And uh, that, you know, the team needs you and how that, that sense of being needed uh, made a difference. I'm just wondering, could you talk about to, that to us and, and uh, how can we do that for other you know, I think, I, I think one of the things is that from a leadership, you know, he, we do so much in leadership, you know, especially in the military, but even in civilian life, we, you know, we want our people to be leaders and we have, you know, we, we send them to schools and, you know, we give them an education, we get seminars on leadership, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, you know, there are certain, you know, there's certain aspects of which we learn, but I think the one aspect is really a human aspect of how you approach people. And, and I always say that in leadership, you know, is a positive and negative. You know, it, you, you, it, my definition of leadership is the ability to influence. And I, and I say that because the ability to lead is conveyed by those who, who you lead. I give you the power to lead me, not because of title or entitlement, but I give you the power. I, as a as part of a squad or a platoon give you as my leader that power to lead me. Well, if you don't live up to that responsibility, well, you know, then it undermines that, that, that whole structure. But you have to understand it. So we become leaders or influence people positively and negatively by your attitudes and how you approach people and what you say or don't say. And this story specifically was when I was in Tokyo and my driving question uh, to myself was in ultimately finding the answer, can I come back and play this game because of the injuries that I received? And finally, I got enough courage to ask my phys physician this question. And his response, his response was something like this, which was, 
don't worry about it. I mean, you're going to have a normal life. You're going to be able to do the things normal people just don't expect to get back in their gridiron. I, because you won't have the strength nor the flexibility to do the things that are necessary to be a running back in the NFL. Correct or not, okay, from his diagnosis. But as my authority figure, what he did was just suck that hope right out. A couple days later, and I get a postcard in the mail. Simple postcard. It's got two lines on it. It said this, Rock, team's not doing well. We need you. Art Rooney, owner of the team. And you go, wow. Not that they needed me, because they surely didn't need me. But it was that somebody took the time to care, to reach out, to make a contact of some nature. And, you know, and that made all the difference in the world because it gave you that little seed of hope that somebody was there to be able to support you. So that was that kind of a, um, of rec of a recognition. And so the rest is you know, up to you to do what you want, but you just, you know, that for me it was like, oh, okay, somebody cared. I think that becomes very important what we do. Uh, why are uh, Mr. Staubach uh, more than Mr. Plyer? Um, Steeler fan and great way of explaining that touchdown. I mean, that was awesome. <laughs> I, I saw it that way completely. Um, well, I just want to say uh, from, your, from both of your perspectives, the Vietnam soldier to the soldiers of now, what do you see, any difference, your thoughts, and, and how we've come from the Vietnam uh, to today? Go ahead. I got thoughts, but go ahead, Ronnie. Well, the, the, my, uh, w when I was in Vietnam, I, I lost a, my uh, roommate that was uh, Cleve Summer. Mike Grammer was a Marine that was uh, caught and tortured and killed. And Tommy Holden, I was in Da Nang, and Tommy sends a, a message to me. Uh, you know, he's out, in, he's out, he's out, he's, in, he's a Marine out there fighting, and he said, hey, Staubach, what are you, what are you doing? I'm going to come into Da Nang. You take me to the old club, you bum. <laughs> and, and, I, and that's Tommy, you know. And he, he, he was shot like a week later. And I've, uh, so I, I just think the military of World War II, of Korea, of Vietnam are just as... Uh, uh, strong and committed as, as any military person today. The difference is, is our society understands that, that uh, these men and women are out there with their necks on their line for us. So I think there's a, is, is, there's, we, we, Vietnam lost that. And the Vietnam veterans that are here have, have helped bring it back because right now uh, there's so much, so many good things going on. I, I, I mean, I'm not talking about myself, but we have a, a Admiral Mullen, you know, the Sea of Goodwill of going from the private sector to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to, to the veteran to, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, get a job when they leave the service. And our allies in service, we've, we've been averaging a job a day in veterans in Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, Med Synergies has hired 30 of our vets, and it's the same thing that comes back. They're loyal, they're teamwork. They persevere and they work hard, and I think that's been true with with our military. It's a consistent pattern. It's, it's how the military's been perceived by the uh, by the public. And uh, uh, the, you know, the good news is that it's being not only perceived that it, that's being. Uh, uh, I, I think we're making our veterans really feel good, and we really care about them. And it makes sense to hire a veteran too. I mean, they. Uh, they have some skills that uh, others just don't have. So I, I mean, I, I think the Vietnam veteran is <laughs> similar to uh, the Afghanistan veteran or the Iraqi veteran as far as uh, uh, just the way they uh, understand life. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, uh, you know, I guess my reaction, I mean, I, I agree with Roger and all those, uh, in all that aspect. Mine it is from an operational point of view. And I, in, in that, you know, there's a couple things is, uh, you know, it, 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 during the Vietnam era, a period of time, it was a replacement war. So you have to understand that it was a replacement war. It wasn't a unit war as we have now. I mean, you, you, you don't go over with a unit for a specific period of time and then it deployed and then come back home. So at that time, eh, you were just a replacement. You were another guy coming into a unit. Um, and so you lost continuity of, of who you were with 
or of, 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 of training together of, of, of a real team atmosphere. That was one. Secondly, policy makes a big difference. I don't care what, um, how, the, how the war was fought, if we were a placement war and or if you, uh, you, know, if you fight as a unit t t today, is that we love to compete. We want to win. We want to win the battle. We want to win the, the, whatever is before us. Give us that opportunity. I think policy in Vietnam didn't give the soldier that opportunity to do so. And so he was restrained. And you go, well, what am I doing here? You know, I, I, we're, not, we're not here to win. We're not here to fight. We're not here. We can't do this. We can't shoot them. We can't, you know, so what are we doing here? And so that's a demoralizing, you know, factor, my, my opinion. So now, at least, you know, you, and there's a couple other things, which is that, you know, our units today, you, you go for a defined period of time, here's your mission, you know, what do we accomplish? I still think there's, there are some restraints, you know, uh, that, uh, that, are, that are on our military that uh, we can't really fulfill maybe our obligation within where we are today, but it's, 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 that's, you know, that, I think that's a big change over a period of time. I think the, the, the all volunteer, you know, from the draft, you know, to the all volunteer is a big change in attitudes and, you know, and so on. And it's not so much for those who are committed and who will serve, you know, because uh, those who, you know, are serving today will, you serve because you want to serve, all right. But from a societal point of view, you know, it's like uh, no one else has any skin in the game from my point of view, it's like, okay, the Patriots, I'm gonna serve, you know, or those who need a job, you know, I'm gonna serve. Well, you know, the rest of us go, thank you, thank you very much, you know. So from a policy point of view in that regards, I don't have any skin in this game, you know, and today, so, you know, I can send you guys off to wherever I want to, or not, or whatever it might be. So I just think that there's, you know, that's some of the changes that have taken place from that period of time. Sir? Ladies and gentlemen, we only have time for one more. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. You know, we're a team. If you look out here, every one of us, in the day I got out of the Marine Corps in 91, I participated, and you are an inspiration but the thing of it is, is that this team, the people sitting here today, can't drop their packs. Our nation is on the verge of ashes. And if we don't stand up, every individual one of us, and do what we can, where we are, whatever we do with our children and everything else. Now, how do you think we can continue to inspire the people around us? Do you have any advice? The two of you. Okay? Now, we've got to get involved. Look at the, what yeah. you've done here. It's remarkable. And what we're doing across the nation is remarkable. But what we need to do is ask ourselves, I guess, what we can do individually to th take and perpetuate the freedom we've got. Well, you know, and, and I just say, to quickly answer that, and that is, uh, you know, within, within our own realm of influence, that those people that we can influence and or talk to as well, is not to be silent about the issues, you know, and to be able to discuss those issues. You know, and I think one of the things, it, it just, it, coming from the Vietnam era people, is that for those of you who had uh, a, 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 a parent or an, a relative that served in Vietnam, it would be interesting to see how much you knew about what they did <laughs> during that period of time. Did they talk about it? Did they ever discuss it? Did they, have a, did they have an opinion about how it translates today? No, that was all repressed and they didn't do it. So the biggest thing are the stories that are being able to be told and to be able to tell those stories or to be able to talk to your families and or your peers and or more more importantly, your relatives and kids, you know, to say this is what's taking place, good or bad, within our service today. This is taking place back and forth. This is my experience because only that way will they have a sense of what this country is all about and their responsibility within it. Well, you know, I, I, I just feel we're, 
we're going in a good direction as far as we as human beings in this country care about our veterans. I'm not saying politically there shouldn't be things that should be done to continue to enhance how important our veterans are. But when you look, look back and, uh, uh, you know, that friggin' Jane Fonda, uh, what, <laughs> I mean, she, she, she's over there with the Viet Cong and, uh, uh, I mean, they shouldn't have let her back in the country. That would not happen today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the respect we have for our veterans, you know, 9-11, you have 19 wackos that are, I mean, they are all educated too, by the way, the 19 that were on these airplanes, on our four airplanes, and the one that hit the Pentagon. I, actually, I was on the board of American at the time. I just, I got on there six months before 9-11. I didn't want to tell you I was on the board of American because you, I know you lost your luggage somewhere and you got, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but, but it really is uh, uh, the, the, the feeling today towards veterans is, is unbelievably positive. Uh, I'm on also on the Veterans Advisory Board for J.P. Morgan, and we got over 200 companies, in, including our company, JLL, that are uh, committed to hire veterans. And most of the companies uh, are re really passionate about it. You know, others, you know, really care about veterans. So the, the, uh, the, the good news is, um, and what's, with, what's going on now between uh, Sunnis and the Shia and, the, and uh, you know, ISIS, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, being a Sunni there, you know, you got Iran or Shia, you got now Russia going into Syria. It's, I think it's confusing for our leaders right now what's going on as far as what, what we have to do. But everybody knows that we have the veterans and we, we, our military is, is very capable, given the right goals and the right uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, I, I just really feel good about how the American public feels about our veterans. And I, I, think, I think our veterans should take advantage of that, too. I mean, when you leave the service, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a great hire. And I, I think, you know, having, having a job past the service is critical to... Uh, making sure that our future veterans see that that, that, that opportunity is there. So I, 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 just, I feel really good about how, how much we love our veterans today. And, I, and there's always, we, could, we, we definitely could always do more, but we're sure headed in the right direction, direction about our caring for our veterans. It's, uh, it's the, the, the challenge is how are we dealing with uh, the bad guys of the world as far as what we're going to do next. So... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a good time to, to be a veteran, but it's also uh, a difficult time. That was a tough qu question, by the way. So I <laughs> <laughs> you did a wonderful job of yeah. sidestepping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our honored guests. Please be seated. At this time, General Cheek has a presentation for our honored guests. They are receiving a United States flag flown over the Pentagon on September 11th, 2015. So uh, on behalf of the United States Army, but also all our other joint partners that are here from the other services, for you, Rocky, we want to present this to you and say thank you. Thank you for your inspirational words, but thank you also for your service and welcome home to you as well. And, uh, and also for Roger Staubach, again, we want to say thank you very much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to spend some time with us. Uh, your words and, uh, and Rocky's as well. Great inspiration to us, and we're very grateful for all you're doing for, I'll say soldiers especially, but all our veterans and helping them find employment as they transition to the civilian life, which we all do someday. So. Thank you. 
So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, well, we're going we're gonna to mail you yours. Okay. To conclude our program, will all Vietnam veterans please step to the front of the room and join General Cheek, Mr. Staubach, and Mr. Blyer for a group photo. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and in place for the departure of our official party.